From a young age, I was actually raised in church. My mom would always make sure we went, you know, even if she didn't go, she would make sure that she sent us. Like, that, and there was even actually a church bus that would come to our neighborhood from time to time. She would make us get on that church bus if she wasn't going. Whether we was at my grandmother's house, we would always have to go to church on Sundays. So I suppose that at the very beginning of my life, that was where the seed was sown. That's why I first started hearing about Jesus as a child from participating in those services with my mom. When I was a teenager, I started to dabble with drugs, playing around with gangs, going around looking to start a fight. But believe it or not, with everything I just said, I really wasn't a bad kid. I know that sounds contradictory with the things I just mentioned, but it wasn't in my heart to be doing those things that I was doing. I was trying to live up to who I thought people wanted me to be, instead of being who I really was on the inside. I was from a real big family. My grandmother had several kids. I can't remember exact, exactly how many, like maybe 10 or something like that, 12. But I was from a real big family. And uh, like a bunch of my kinfolk would end up incarcerated. And it was like so much that it almost seemed like a family passage, like a, a rite of passage almost. It was, I, I guess now that I'm looking at it, it was more like a generational curse. But it happened so frequently that it almost will put you in the mindset of, uh, you know, not if I end up in prison, when, you know, like I'm waiting on my turn. And uh, man, I gotta say, uh, if I'm being honest about it, I really liked not to go into prison for it, but whenever one of my uncles would come home or some, they have a party for them, or you know, everybody would be so happy to see him, and they have new tattoos. I like the tattoos, and man, uh, I really, I couldn't wait on my turn to get some tattoos, because I felt like at the time, tattoos come from jail, and I really liked that. I was a mama's boy. At the time, when I was young and getting in trouble and carrying on, uh, you never, you could ask my mom, and she probably would, to this day, my mom would probably say, Casanova was a good kid growing up, but I, I really did everything I could to hide my trouble from my mom because I didn't want to disappoint my mom. Me and my mom were real close growing up, and uh, I cared a whole lot about, you know, uh, what my mom thought about not embarrassing her, and you know, because my mom would brag on me in such a way that, you know, it was almost like, oh, I kind of hate to be doing the things that I'm doing. You know, because uh, like I said, I was a mama's boy, man, and I, I really, really wanted to uh, make my mom proud. But at the time, I was bigger than most grown men. A little too strong for my own good. And uh, I used to throw it around, man. I was I was being a bully, even though I didn't want to be a bully. You know, uh, me and my friends, we would gather together, jump in the car, or walk around the neighborhood, or go to the local mall, go find somebody to jump on. Like we go to find random people to just go beat them up because we didn't have nothing else to do. You know, uh, and, and, and what makes it so bad is that on the inside, I was so tender hearted that we would be going somewhere and I'm finding somebody to beat up like this and uh, I would be acting all tough after I beat them up or you know, they jumped on somebody and acting all hard. But on the inside, it would be tearing me apart, man, because I, I didn't, I, it would hurt me to see somebody that I hurt like that for no reason. And, uh, you know, even, man, real early on, you know, now that I'm thinking back on it, man, I was always tend to hold the kid, man. Uh, but I, my actions didn't show who I really was. I was trying to live up to some kind of image. And no, this would make it so bad, nobody even put that image, nobody even told me to be that. Like, I, I, I put the image on myself. Uh, you know, I, I talk about how I'm, I'm currently right now, I'm seven foot tall, you know, probably at 14 years old or somewhere in there. You know, I was probably a good 6'6", six, six, something like that. Uh, 280, 90 pound teenager, you know, with a chip on his shoulder for no reason. Uh, not realizing that I was letting the enemy use me. But uh, I was throwing that around, man. And, you know, uh, I, I have no idea, you know, where my headspace was at the time. That's the way a majority of my teenage years went, you know, just more of the same thing out there, drinking and drugging and carrying on and 
uh, drunk, jumping on people here and there, you know, just doing the things that, you know, I knew better than to be doing. So somewhere around about 20 years old, I had just got my first place, like, you know, with my own money. I just got my first place. Uh, I was working, I had got a job. I was working at uh, 84 Lumber. And uh, my girlfriend at the time had just uh, decided to move in with me. We were doing serious drugs, but mostly uh, ecstasy and Xanax. But emphasis on Xanax. You know, we, we really were doing those. And uh, one day I was going to work and I was way too, too, too drugged out to be at work. You know, the, the boss there uh, and a friend of mine that was working there too. You know, they was like, hey man, look, you, 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 you really need to go home. And uh, that day I had got uh, my girlfriend at the time to drop me off because like I said, she was just moving in with me and uh, we were using my vehicle. So she came to pick me up. I stumbled onto the car and uh, I got in. And so we, we lived in the city over from the city that I worked in. But the city that I had worked in, that was the city that she was staying in. She was staying with uh, a friend of hers uh, and his girlfriend at the time. And we were leaving my job and she wanted to go grab a few things from the house, you know, some of her last little few things that she had left over there that she wanted to bring back to where we were staying. And uh, so at the time of her leaving, she had kind of got into it with the guy and the girl that she was staying with and they were kind of on bad terms. So she went over there and just so happened that they were not there. So she was gonna, you know, kind of go in and get her things while they weren't there. And I was out of my mind, wasted sitting in the car, you know, just waiting on her to grab her things and come out. So she went and grabbed her things. And uh, when she come out, amongst the things that she had grabbed, uh, she had stole the guy's gun. So on the way home, we needed some gas. We were gonna go by the store and get a little gas. So when we got to the store, we realized that we didn't have any money. All the money was at the house. And so we were just gonna steal some gas, you know? So this was at a time when pay a, you could, you could just go up to the pump and turn the pump on and run the gas and then you could go in the store and pay for it. You know, this was before you had to pay before you pump. So uh, we were gonna go to the store and steal some gas. So we were still in the city that where my job was at, which is kind of located in the city area here. And uh, so, you know, when we pulled up the thing, I was like, nah, I wouldn't steal no gas from here. And, I, and just, you know, suggestingly I said, if I was gonna steal some gas, I would probably steal some gas from Van Cleave which is a rural city uh, here in the area where we live. It's a, a sparsely populated city. And the, I was saying that because Van Cleve does not have a police station. You know, they have a sheriff. So, you know, no telling when you see a cop out that way. So I was like, if I was gonna steal some gas, that's where I do it from. And uh, mind you, that like I said, we was on Xanax and carrying on. And uh, so one thing about Xanax is that it, it, it affects your memory. Like if you eat too much of it, you it'll, it'll make you black out and have memory lapses. Especially the next day after you've done too many, you don't remember what happened. But uh, man, so after I said that, it's like I just woke up and we were in Van Cleve, uh coming over here to steal some gas. And and just on a, on a side note, this is how out of our mind we was. Uh, Van Cleve was twice as far as the ride to the house was. We could have just rode to the house and got some money and got gas, but anyway, so we over here to steal some gas and now we got this shiny new gun. And uh, so turns out we are gonna use this shiny new gun and might as well get a couple of dollars while we over here to steal some gas. We might as well go ahead and get this money. Why not? They don't have a police station. We get busted. We're on the front page of the paper. Here I am, sitting in jail, $100,000 bond, trying to figure out what I'm gonna do, how I'm gonna tell my parents what just happened. What, what, where do I go from here? So I finally mustered up the courage to call home. I actually talked to my stepdad, he was the one that I talked to. And uh, 
me being a, a novice criminal, accidentally confessed over the phone to my stepdad what I had just done. <laughs> the police had everything they needed to get a good conviction out of me. So fast forward, I bond out of jail. And sometime later, uh, get checked into a rehab. Stayed into the rehab center. And, and just on another side note, get kicked out of the rehab center on the day I was supposed to graduate. But the rehab center had done its job. I had actually managed to quit all the hard drugs. I would still smoke a little marijuana here from time to time. But all the hard stuff that I felt like at the time was really responsible for what I had going on, I had, I had quit it. You know, I threw my life away enough already. And, you know, so I, I didn't mess with none of that stuff no more. So contrary to what most people think, when you catch a charge, you don't actually go to jail. Like, to most people, they think that you'll catch a charge and, all right, you did this today, you're in prison tomorrow. That's not how it works. What, how it actually works is you catch a charge and you'll go to court, you'll get a bond, and if you manage to make bond, you'll be out on bond. So you'll catch a charge, you could murder someone, catch a charge, and the next day you'll be out walking the streets. And But here's what happens. You might stay out for two years, or three or four or five years, or maybe a few months, but you could, you'll be out of jail for God knows how long until you actually go to court and be tried for what you did. So here I am out on bond. Uh, I'm as, as clean as I have been since I was a kid. Not doing anything. Like I said, I smoke a little pot here and there. Um, I can really settle down a lot. Starting to kind of go to church. You know, my mom was really encouraging me to give my troubles to the Lord, you know, and uh, I'm already worried about when the time comes for me to face trial, uh, my parents had just helped me to pay for an attorney, and my attorney was telling me at the time, look, you're not actually gonna go to jail. You're a first time offender, you've never been in trouble before like this. Worst case scenario, you'll get some probation. And so, uh, man, I really started going to church and trying to halfway do right. You know, I would quit smoking weed from here and there, time to time, and actually trying to do right a little bit, you know? And, uh, I was under the impression that I wasn't going to jail for what I had did. And I was thankful for it. I was thankful to God for it. And uh, I started going to church. And I was really, really sticking in there for the most part. Fast forward, and I got my day in court. So when I got to court, like I said, I was under the impression that I wasn't actually going to jail. I was here to get some probation time. And uh, this was a, a plea hearing. Because my lawyer had told me that, look, yeah, they, they know everything. You had, you said it. They got it. They got a confession from you, basically, from the recorded phone conversation. But when I got to court, things started to go way differently than what I was expecting. My lawyer had completely changed his tune. And uh, when I got there, the very first thing my lawyer said to me was, okay, we know you're going to jail. We're just trying to figure out for how long. I was distraught, you know, at the time I didn't know that there was a valuable lesson to be learned in that situation. You can be forgiven for something by God, but when God forgives you, that does not mean that you don't have to pay for the consequences of your actions. And that was what I was doing that day. The judge looked at me and said something that I won't ever forget. He looked at me and he squinted his eyes like this and he said, I feel like 15 years is fair. I looked back at my mom, I looked at my stepdad, my brother was there, um, I looked back at them, and they were all surprised, and my mom came up and she spoke for me, you know, and I'm thankful for that. The words my mom said that day, they really stuck with me. But I got those 15 years, seven years to serve, eight years of probation. That newfound faith I had just gotten, Man, he was shaking. I mean, to the core. So now here I am in prison. For the first two years, I was not sure if I wanted to be a gangbanger or a Christian. 
I didn't know where to go. I was I was hurt because I felt like God had let me down. Because not not thinking of I let myself down by doing what I did. I was thinking that hey, man, I, if God, if you love me like that, you wouldn't let me go to prison. I felt like I had got a bum rap. You know, in other states, uh, armed robbery doesn't hold as much time as it does here in Mississippi. Like in California, I think the maximum you can get like three to five years. But here in Mississippi, you just about gonna get 15 years minimum every time. But uh, most people get 15 years. And I didn't know that me just doing actual seven years in prison was actually pretty good for the charge here in this state. So for those two years, I was kind of on the fence. I wanted to be sticking to the faith that I had just found, but I also didn't want to seem weak to the other prisoners. And so that's why I was doing the things that I was doing. You know, anytime somebody would say something to me, I'd be ready to fight about it. Let's go right here, right now type attitude. You know, because I wanted to, the only thing I knew about prison was what I was told by my kinfolk and what I knew from TV or what have you. You know, somebody gives you problems, you handle it right then and right there. So I had that kind of mentality, uh, attitude and that kind of mentality. And uh, that was what I was going with for at the time. So during those two years, I was kind of getting into some contraband. And I was thinking that, you know, uh, I'm gonna make me a little money to be able to send home here and there doing some illegal things. So while I was at a facility in Jefferson County, uh, I went, I was the property man there. And I went to get some contraband that I had sent to the prison. I had got a pound of marijuana, a hundred black and mild cigars, uh, some knives, and among other things. And when I come inside with them, I, uh, I was met by the guards. They Somebody had told on me, and they were all right there, and there was no turning back, no running, no hiding it. I was busted. And uh, they got me, took me to the hole, two weeks. So I sat in the hole. I was stressed out of my mind, even way more than when I had first caught those uh First caught that charge when I had got those 15 years because introducing contra uh, contraband to a facility is a felony within itself. And then the marijuana itself was a felony. The knives itself was another felony. And man, I was facing another 25 years in prison. Already in prison for seven years for something I had already did. I mean, man, it was, the devil was after me, man. It was, it was, it was just, way too much for me to bear. And I I, I thought of killing myself because I, I was already thinking that I couldn't do these seven years and I was definitely not gonna be able to do another whatever I was about to get. So in the hole at that facility, for whatever reason, and this may very well be illegal, but at the hole at that facility, the only thing that they would allow you to have was a Bible. You might, you may have been able to have a Quran or something too, but the only thing they let you have was a Bible, as far as I knew. And uh, man, when you're sitting in there in the hole and there is nobody to talk to, nothing to look at, you don't even know what day it is, what time it is, and the only book I can have is a Bible, I started to read. During that time in the hole was the absolute most important time of my life. Because for the first time, when I started to read the word in that Bible, in that solitude, I actually started to feel the presence of God. I actually, like I felt, like when I was reading, I could feel a being sitting next to me. And it was, it was peaceful, it was comforting. I had never known that kind of comfort. And I had told God, whatever happens in this situation, I'm gonna give you everything I got. And that was when my real walk began. Prison church services, was prison, prison ministry services. Uh, I got baptized right there at uh, the next facility I had went to because once I got out of the hole, they shipped me out from that facility. And at the time they had a program called uh, the BMP. It was the Behavior Modification Program. 
and they sent me to that for any time you get in any kind of trouble. And uh, I ended up in that facility and I ended up getting baptized there. Uh, man, I ended up receiving the Holy Ghost. And so over that next five years of time, that was when I started to actually build a relationship with God. And I wanted to put a small note, a little side note in this testimony. Uh, during that time of me forming a relationship with God, I have met, until this day, I met the absolute most godly people I have met in this life, until this day, in prison. Uh, other prisoners and the people who were coming into the prison who weren't getting paid a dime to come in and minister from Cross Gate Baptist Church, from uh, Missionary Baptist Church. Then they were coming from, I was in uh, Rankin County when I experienced that other church. And they were driving here from the Gulf Coast all the way up there, not getting paid a dime. But uh, I said all that because, man, I some of the best friends I've ever made, some of the most godly men that I've ever come across, all I met in that prison. And some, you guys are familiar with. Yeah, so for those next five years of uh, prison time, I didn't, I'm not saying that I got it always right because, man, some I stumbled and I failed. Sometimes even harder than others. Uh, but that foundation, it had been laid. That foundation, which is Jesus, it had been laid and it stuck with me. And I stood on that. So after I had got out, I had made my mind up. I was going to prove to myself and to the whole world that what I had just found wasn't just some prison religion. I wanted to prove that I had really formed a real relationship with Jesus. So when I got out, my feet hit the ground, I took off. I joined up with my local body, with a pastor that I had grew up with, somebody that I knew who was a genuine man of God that uh, I witnessed the transformation in my own eyes. I joined up with that brother and we took off. You know, uh, man, and it was, a, it was a real beautiful thing. And then at the time, I had experienced something that I didn't have to experience when I was locked up. And, and, and this is what I believe causes what we know as jailhouse religion. When you're in jail or in prison, it, it's, it's something in prison, it's something not in prison that you don't have to deal with while you're in prison. The cares of the world. The cares of the world had come to me. I had gotten sick. My health had begun to decline. Six collapsed lungs, chronic kidney disease, polycythemia, which is a, a blood disease. And then on top of that, I had threw out my back and uh, ruptured a disc in my back. And the bills would not stop coming just because I wasn't feeling well. And man, that really had, that hurt me. That hurt me a lot because man, it was hard to to go through that, I'm gonna be honest with you guys. And uh, man, I, I, I continued to stumble. I stumbled and I fell away. I didn't fall away like I quit believing or I quit worshiping God. But what I did was I quit doing the work that I was putting in. Um, and when you quit putting in the same effort that you already been putting in, it, it starts to put a strain on that relationship. It's just like being in a relationship uh, with somebody, with your with your partner. If you quit putting the effort to that relationship, y'all start to grow distant. It's not that you don't love that person anymore, it's just that the effort is not there anymore and it's starting to show. And that, that was what was beginning to happen with my walk because, man, whenever I started going through those things, it was a real challenge for me because it was like, man, God, you, man, you really putting it on me real thick. You know, it's starting to, I started to feel like it was more than I could bear. Uh, I had I had had two sons, and I was I was thinking that I was thinking I was gonna die. You know, and uh, 
I, I, I just, I wasn't prepared for that. So all the time, through all that sickness, through all those hard days, I started to realize that God was using those things to draw me closer to Him. And even until this day right now, I still deal with those things. And uh, for some of you guys who frequently watch my channel, you'll notice that when I'm working, I'm usually, I might be sitting down on something or I might take a break or I might sweat. If you listen real closely in the background, you can hear my breathing. It's kind of hard. And that's what those things are from. I just never told you guys before. Uh, but that's what those things are from, man, is with the health issues that I constantly deal with. But y'all see right now to this day, I stand on that foundation, which is Jesus. I found my way back into that fold. And here I am right now serving God with everything that I got, with all my might. I give it everything that I got because I know from where my help comes from. So for those of you guys who stuck around to the end, and I want to thank you guys for all uh, listening to my testimony, man. Um, I got to be honest with you all. I have been reluctant to put my testimony on here because it it could affect my job, to be honest with you guys. And that's why I was always hesitant to do it. That's why I'm just now doing it. But, man, in the, really, in, in, in the recent studies I've been doing, uh, speaking with some men of God, uh, and just what God's been giving to me and the scriptures that have been coming to me, uh, God reminded me that. God reminded me how it is that we as Christians overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. And I was never going to be able to overcome if I didn't put my testimony out there because that's one of the two things that I need to be able to overcome. I got the blood of the Lamb. But without putting my testimony out there, there was no overcoming to be done. And so I can't be sitting up worried about whether or not I'm going to be uh, fired from my job. I can't be worried about what somebody going to think or nothing like that. I, I tell my testimony when I'm out here on the streets or when I'm praying with someone or something like that right there. But putting my testimony here to where, you know, ministering on camera uh, is an important thing. You know, it's part of who I am. It's part of letting you guys get to know who it is that you're listening to. So I want to thank you guys for stopping through again. I appreciate you all. I love you all. And uh, I hope to see you guys all back again. And we'll get back to our normally scheduled programming. So until we meet again, I'll see you guys next time. Profit a man if he gains the whole Look, and see, loses I done came a long way. And still got ways to go. I'm on a mission trying to save some souls. I done came a long way. Still got ways to go. Holy Spirit, help me save some souls. I done came a long way. Still got ways.